We're going to start in Exodus 8. We're going to read verses 25 through 28, breaking out of Satan's compromise. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye therefore, sacrifice to your God in the land. I want you to take note of that little phrase. We're coming back to it, in the land, okay? And Moses said, It is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only ye shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. And uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into this passage. Father, we thank you for the infallible Word of God this morning. We thank you for the many lessons, and I pray that you would strengthen our faith. And I pray that if there's someone here without Jesus, that their heart would be turned towards Christ today. We pray for the victims' families of the church in uh, Texas, Lord, the First Baptist Church of Sutherland. We ask for their comfort. We thank you today for your guidance, for your safety, for the privilege of worshiping you this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, throughout the Scriptures, God is calling people to Himself. God wants a relationship with you. Christianity is not about a relationship with a church. It's about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And God wants a relationship with you. And he's uh, very jealous of that relationship. In fact, if you've ever studied the Ten Commandments, it begins in Exodus 20 when God says, I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now, in a very God-like way, God has a loving jealousy for you, and He wants to walk with you and talk with you, and He wants you to acknowledge His presence in your life. And so we have, on the one hand, God calling the children of Israel out to be with Him and calling you out. That's why you're here today. God called you out to be with Him, to hear His Word. But as surely as God is calling us to be with Himself, Satan is pulling us away from God. And Satan's trying to cut little deals to keep us out of church, out of the Bible, and less committed. Satan is always pulling on us so that we don't go all the way over there with God. He's always trying to pull us back so that we would not fully surrender. In the New Testament, the Bible speaks about the flesh pulling against the Spirit, and the Spirit pulling against the flesh. So in the book of Exodus, it's all about God calling the children of Israel out of Egypt. And He says, I want my people out. And He says to Pharaoh, let my people go. That's what God is doing here. And throughout the Scriptures, God is calling His people unto Himself. And when God wants to warn His people about uh, the world, the flesh, the devil, uh, the wrong way of living, he often refers to the nation of Egypt as a picture, as, as an illustration of what he's calling us from. For example, in Exodus chapter 16 and verse 3, we read, when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full, talking about Egypt as a place of consumption of lust. It was a place of lust. Egypt was a place where people just thought of themselves and filled themselves up. That was one of the pictures of Egypt. Egypt was also a place of idolatry. So when God spoke about Egypt, He spoke about their bondage. And in Deuteronomy 29, 17, it says, Ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. Uh, and so uh, when we read about Egypt, we read about a picture of what Satan wants to do. He wants to pull us into a place of bondage and idolatry and far away from God. And whether you recognize it or not, there's a constant pull to pull us away from fellowship with the Lord in this world in which we live, through the media, through people at work, through Satan's demonic powers. There's a constant pull. And Egypt is a picture of the pull of the world. And so throughout the book of Exodus, God says, I want my people to leave Egypt, and I want them to go three days' journey out in the wilderness, and I want them to worship me, and I want their total attention. By the way, how many of you believe God deserves our attention once in a while? That's what God wants in our worship. 
That's why we hear the songs, and that's why we give, and that's why we're here, to give God our attention. Everything else gets our attention. Work gets our attention, and bills get our attention, and the yard gets our attention, and the neighbor's dog gets our attention. How many of you believe God deserves our attention this morning? So God says, I want you to come three days journey. I want you to come out and spend some time with me. But you know the story, don't you? Pharaoh kept ignoring Moses. Pharaoh kept ignoring God. And so God begins to bring some plagues on Pharaoh. And God begins to judge Pharaoh and Egypt because they would not let his people go. By the way, we live in a land where increasingly people hate God. Increasingly, people have uh, this spirit against the things of God. And and it's amazing. I I had just a little article published uh, on Fox News yesterday just about marriage and about the need for God in marriage. You cannot imagine the hate and the hate mail and the antagonism towards something as simple as marriage and the belief that God ordained marriage. By the way, how many of you believe God ordained marriage? (laughs) Kind of a basic thought. But people that hate God, people that hate the thought of marriage, people that have been burned and become bitter, many times harden their hearts. And in this hardened day, you would think with hurricanes and difficulties and earthquakes and shootings, somebody would stop and say, God, we repent and we need your help. But Pharaoh would never repent. And so God brought the plagues upon Egypt. This is not a fairy tale. It's very well documented in secular as well as sacred literature. God turned the Nile and all the fresh water to blood in chapter 7. Frogs plagued Egypt in chapter 8. Lice came down as well uh, in uh, chapter 8. The flies came down and swarmed all upon Egypt. Cattle had disease. There were boils. uh, Hail mixed with fire. There was locusts. There was darkness. And finally, there was the death of the firstborn. All of this because Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not listen to God. He would not let his people to go. And so, when we come to the Word of God in chapter 8, we see Moses holding faithful bringing the message to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is not yet letting the people go, but he's going to begin to offer some compromise plans. You see, the devil's never willing to let you fully surrender to God. He's never going to let that happen. But he'll try to play, let's make a deal with you. He'll try to get you to go a little way with God, but not all the way with God. And that's what Pharaoh tries to do. I want you to see this in four temptations that Pharaoh offers. And follow with me very quickly. First, there was the temptation to conform. There was a temptation to conform. Now come back to verse 25. Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. Would you say those words again? In? So here we have a conforming invitation. They could go sacrifice as long as they didn't completely leave the land. In other words, Pharaoh's saying, just stay here among our idols, among our wickedness. It's as if he was saying, you can kind of, you know, have your Christianity, but don't get carried away with it. Uh, Just kind of stay here and kind of hang out and do what you've always done. Now in the New Testament it says this in 1 Corinthians 6, 17 for us who are Christians. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Now that was referring to pagan idol worship in the first century. Uh, It could refer to other idols. It could refer to the idol of alcoholism or sensuality. Whatever it was in your past, God says after you get saved, I want you to come out from that and I want you to come all the way unto me. Come out and be separate. And God had said to Moses, I want my children to go three days away from all this nonsense, from all these idols. And I want them to worship me there. I want their total attention there. Now, how many of you know that in this type of a conforming invitation, there is sometimes a peer pressure? It's sort of like someone says, well, you know, you you cannot get a raise, you cannot get a promotion unless you go to the officer's club, unless you hang out with the boys afterward. And you can still be a Christian and everything. It's okay if you go to church and stuff. But just kind of hang out with the crowd. Just kind of do what we do. Maybe laugh at a dirty joke or something. Just kind of stay in the land, man. Don't go all the way out for God. Just 
You know, you can be religious, but stay in the land. This is what Pharaoh was saying. There was an interview done with a man who had lived to be 100 years old, and they asked him this question. They said, what do you think is the best thing about being your age? And he said, well, no peer pressure. And, you know, we talk about these 19 and 20-year-olds and how they get peer pressure to do dumb things and sometimes even just mark their bodies and, and uh, get wasted because of peer pressure. But how many of you would admit peer pressure affects everybody? And imagine the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh, saying, all right, look it, here's how you can worship your God. Just do it in the land. But notice the courageous response of Moses. In verse 26, he says something interesting. Moses said, it is not meet to so do, to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Now, if you're taking notes, take note of that word abomination. And this is what it means. In the nation of, of Egypt, people would worship the very animals that the Jews were going to sacrifice. So they would worship the ram. They would worship the innocent lamb. They were polytheistic. They worshiped many different kinds of God. The god Isis, uh, many other gods they worshiped in Egypt. And so what Moses was saying is, Pharaoh, if we stay in the middle of Egypt, we're going to be killing the very stuff that you worship. In fact, notice what he says there in verse number 26. He says, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and, and will they not stone us? In other words, if we kill these animals, they're going to stone us because we're violating their law right in front of them. So Moses refuses to stay in the land. In fact, Moses decides to obey God. Verse 27, notice it says, we will go three days journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. Moses said, Pharaoh, I don't care how much pressure you put on me, I am going to go three days with God. I don't care if people make fun of us. I don't care if we look like nuts. We're going to go out in the middle of the desert. We're going to worship God the way that he said we should. Would be to God that every teenager that is tempted uh, with, uh, uh, with some type of premarital sex or some type of drinking or some type of drug, would be to God that every Christian teenager that's tempted uh, to live an ungodly life would say, I'm going to obey God and I don't care who makes fun of me. I'm not staying there. I'm going to come out here and obey God. Now this is the spirit of the text. The spirit of the text is that we need a courageous response when we are tempted to compromise. And so we see the temptation to conform. Folks, it's so subtle and it comes upon us and we don't even recognize how the good old boys want us to conform and how sometimes the television's pushing us to conform and so forth. And we see here, first of all, the temptation to conform. Notice secondly, there is the temptation to compromise. Now, notice what Pharaoh says in verse 28. This is amazing. Pharaoh said, I will let you go that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only ye shall not go very far away. Now, compromise is keeping oneself close enough to the world to still be influenced by it and yet kept in bondage by it. So what Satan is saying is, all right, look it. You can go worship God. Just don't get carried away with it. Just, just don't go all the way with this thing. Notice, notice the key phrase in verse 28. Ye shall not go very far away. You know, you don't need to do like the Sunday night, for heaven's sake. You don't need to, you know, do like the discipling. I mean, you can go along with this Christianity, Satan says. Just don't go too far with it. And he says that to many, many people today. And it's amazing to me how many churches are accommodating that. People want less, so they give less. They want less preaching, they give less preaching. More entertainment, they give it. Why? Because there's this idea that people don't want to go very far. By the way, how many of you know we're not here to worship each other, we're here to worship God today? That's the purpose of it, to worship the living God. I read the, an article this past week out of Christian Post, and it was about a pastor named Carl Lentz, who's one of the pastors at a uh, liberal and, and Pentecostal type uh, church called the Hillsong Church. And, and he was photographed recently at a bar putting vodka shots down with Justin Bieber. And here's the pastor and Justin Bieber. Now, by the way, it's quite common in a lot of the secret churches. And hey, you want to meet me as your pastor? I'll meet you down at the bar. By the way, we won't be having that meeting in this church, I guarantee you that. 
later that same pastor was interviewed on the Oprah Network, and they asked, they asked him, are Christians the only one who believe that you can have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Pretty straightforward question. The pastor said, no, I believe that when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the, the way I read that, Jesus said, he's the road marker, he's the map. You can find other, you can find God other ways. Now let me just pull over here for just a quick minute to say, Jesus is not the road marker or the map. Jesus is exactly what the Bible said. He is the way, the truth, and the life. But you see, when the devil says, don't go very far, I mean, don't be so adamant, don't be so fundamental about, you know, Jesus, don't, don't get so carried away with it, Not, pretty soon you have what we call an accommodating theology. That is, where even churches begin to accommodate the world's belief into their philosophy. And, and so we see that there is, first of all here, a compromising proposal that is made. Don't go too far away. And oh, how we need to be careful with that. Because of peer pressure, many times a girl feels weird to be modest, or a boy feels weird not to cuss, and, and they feel weird to carry a Bible maybe to lunch, or whatever. And, and we need to recognize we're not, we're not called to be weirdos or idiots, but we are called to be different. And listen, the men and women who have changed this world are the men and women the world could not change. And God is calling on us to be faithful today in our generation I love the quote found in the Bible Exposition Commentary. Don't go too far away, the enemy whispers, or people will call you a fanatic. Demolish that proposal. The enemy says, don't go too far away. Well, you don't want to be a fanatic. Now, I get a kick out of that because how many of you know Dodger fans don't mind being called Dodger fans? Right? Green Bay Packer fans, they were, fans wear cheese on their head. They don't mind being fanatic for their team. Listen, never be ashamed of being a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. Just, just simply recognize that it's our privilege. There was a preacher years ago in the South in the 1950s, and they had certain standards that they would not compromise for their Sunday school teachers. And uh, they, they had some requirements. We have similar requirements here. And though the times keep changing, you pray for me that I stand by my convictions and by Bible convictions in those areas. Amen. Amen. I told you you got to help me this morning a little bit. So, And this preacher, he had uh, someone in his church that was testing that. And by the way, let me just pause to say, anybody's welcome at Lancaster Baptist Church. We don't care where they're from, what they've done, how they're dressed. You just bring them in. But, but when it comes to someone who's behind a podium, we have some requirements here, just like where you work has requirements about certain things. You can't show up to the, you can't show up to the uh, sheriff's station and just uh, wearing a tank top and flip-flops and going out on duty. I don't care to see my doctor in that condition. You know what I'm saying. There's, there's decorum. And so this pastor back in the 1950s, he had a man in his church whose name was Willie Nelson. And the pastor called Willie Nelson and he said, now Willie, here's the thing. You're either going to stop playing at the beer joints and stop drinking alcohol and getting drunk or you're going to stop teaching our children in Sunday school. Can anybody say amen for the pastor there? Amen. Willie Nelson said, and I quote to the pastor, you must be nuts. The pastor did not back down. How many of you know I'm so proud of that pastor for that? He said, the man didn't realize how everyone came to hear me sing at the church and how much money I gave. Nelson said, I had to choose between satisfying all those hypocrites at the church. Have you ever noticed when somebody's backsliding, everyone else is the hypocrite? I said, you got to help me this morning here. Have you ever noticed that? When someone's backsliding, everyone else is the hypocrite. So Willie Nelson uh, who's, uh, who's a pot-smoking, tax-evading uh, rock star, is now calling the Christians the hypocrites. And he says in this interview, he says, So I decided to side with those who smoke and cuss and pick my guitar and sing in the dance halls. I decided to stay with the beer joints. The preacher sounded wrong to me, so I quit that Baptist church. 
Willie Nelson said, I've discovered a world full of people who believe in reincarnation, and all the King James Bible does is cover up reincarnation. The Aquarian gospel has had a great impact on me. It explained everything to my satisfaction. By the way, one day, Willie Nelson will stand before God for denying the truth of the Word of God. In James chapter 4 and verse 4 says it this way, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. So when Pharaoh said, Hey Moses, look, at you can go, but just stay right here close to the world. Don't go too far. Moses knew that that just wasn't going to be the case. You can't be the friend of the world and the friend of God, and many Christians today want both ways. And God was simply saying to Moses, Moses, I want you to go three days journey i want you to come out and be separate and worship me with your whole attention and so pharaoh said stay near to the world stay connected to the world but god says love not the world you know what i found sometimes we fear men so much because we fear god so little the fear of the lord is the beginning of what say it with me the fear of the lord is the beginning of so when we fear the Lord, we're going to make right decisions. It doesn't matter what the old boy club wants us to do. It doesn't matter what people are saying on Facebook. It doesn't matter what some other teenagers are doing. I've got a greater fear in my heart for God than I do for these people, you see. That's how Moses was. Moses had a great respect and awe for God in his heart. So here we see a compromising proposal. Notice a very considerate response. Moses, in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 30, Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses and removed the swarm of the flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. Look at this, Exodus 8, 31. And there remained not one. How many of you would agree with me if there was not one fly left in Egypt, that was a miracle? I mean, that's like the 11th miracle in this story, I'm telling you right now. So, you know, Moses goes out and he actually prays for Pharaoh. I mean, what a considerate and godly man. But Pharaoh kept tempting him. He said, he said first of all, look at Moses. Why don't you just stay in the land? Just be like us. Don't be too different. And he's trying to tell some of you that. Yeah, go to church, but don't change anything else. And then he says, all right, all right, all right, Moses, look at you, you can You can worship your God, but don't go too far with this thing. Don't get carried away with this whole idea. I mean, it's, it's okay to do the Willie Nelson thing. It's okay. And, and so it is. Many Christians are kind of accommodating the world today. Well, notice thirdly, a third temptation. Maybe you've been tempted to conform. Maybe you've been tempted to compromise your convictions. But notice the third one, a, a temptation to corrupt. And every one of you that have children, I want you to pay attention for the next five minutes because I want you to know that Satan wants to corrupt families. He wants to divide families. In other words, he's like, all right, you can have the old generation, but give me the kids. That's the devil's. Listen, that didn't start with communism. That started with Satan. Say, really? All right, well, let's look at what he says here. Exodus 10. Everybody got your Bible open? All right, Exodus 10, 8. And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go? So now he's not talking about where. Now he's saying, who's going to go with you, right? Look at this. And Moses said, we will go with our young and with our old and with our sons and with our daughters and with our flocks and with our herds we will go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. How many of you get the idea? Moses was sold out lock, stock, and barrel. I mean, everything and everyone was going to go and worship the Lord. Verse 10, and he said unto them, let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones. Look to it, for evil is before you. This is what the Lord said to Moses. Verse 11, this is Pharaoh. Not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. So notice here a divisive proposal. And here's the proposal of Pharaoh. It divides family unity. Pharaoh is saying this. You take the men but leave the women and the children behind. And this is what the devil says today. Oh, you can have, you know, uh, the greatest generation. You can have those people that want to have their tent meeting and sing to the Lord and have their time of worship. That's for the old fogies anyway. But let the children stay behind and watch HBO and play demonic games 
And just, just leave the children behind, Moses. You can go out there and do the religious thing, but you leave the children behind. By the way, Karl Marx, uh, the, the infamous communist, said the education of all children from the moment that they can get along without a mother's care shall be in state institutions at state expense. And, and many Christians, and I'm not speaking to any one person here today, I hope you're not doing this, but many Christians today, if, if they were honest, they're allowing the public school and the media to influence their children more than they influence their children. And I'm talking about a public school system that has gay pride week and that teaches that we all came from monkeys and, 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 and all of these types of things and, and we, we let them become indoctrinated with these wicked philosophies and then we let them come home and watch it on the television and you're doing exactly what the devil wants. Hey, you do your little church thing out there but give me the minds of your children and that is exactly what the devil wants us to do and that's how he divides families and all how we need to have a passion the Bible says train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it many people say well we just let our children make up their own mind they're good kids they're rotten sinners what are you talking about I hate to pop your bubble but I've got four wonderful children I've got nine beautiful grandchildren and one should come at any moment number 10 on the way and they're all sinners they bite each other they come to my house and fight for toys. They're rotten. You say, how can you say such a thing about your grandchildren? They're the most wonderful grandchildren. I love them. But I'm just telling you, they all need the Lord. You know, we have opportunity to turn in prayer requests, and you can text those in or call the office, fill out little forms, put it in the offering plate. Last Monday morning, I had all the prayer requests coming in to me, and, and I was sorting them so I could pray. And one of them was from my eight-year-old grandson, Camden. And his prayer request was that his four-year-old brother would get saved. Pray for Chandler to get saved. And Chandler needs to get saved. And I'm just telling you, people who say, well, I just let my children make up their own mind, that's not what the Bible says. You're listening to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's like, hey, just keep your kids here in Egypt. You go out there and do the worship thing, and, but, but I'll take care of the children. It's like the devil's plan, you see, to separate a family. A little boy came to school late, and he walked into class, and his teacher said, where have you been? He said, I'm sorry, I was just, just, just running late, and, and my mom and dad were fighting. And the teacher said, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but you live three doors down from the school. I mean, you could have just gotten here. He said, no, ma'am. He said, you see, my mom had one shoe, one of my shoes in one hand, and my dad had one of my shoes in the other hand. And there's a lot of families like that today, divided. Listen, husbands and wives, walk with Jesus together. Defer to one another and obey the Lord together and bring your children on the journey you see, here this proposal divides family unity. It destroys family heritage. Notice this, if you would, the destroying of family heritage. Verse 11, not so. Go now ye that are men and serve the Lord, for, ye did, uh, for, for uh, this ye did desire. You see, Pharaoh is saying, all right, you guys go, but let's not have the whole family in the heritage. Let's not all of us be so committed. So there is a divisive proposal, but notice a committed response. Verse 9, did you see what, Pharaoh, what Moses said in verse 9? We will go with with our young, with our old, with our sons, with our daughters, with our flocks, with our herd, we will go. Thank the Lord again for men in this room who said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And when our kids hit those teenage years, they get a little rebellious and they want to ask why, 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 why. I'm going to tell them the best I can, but I'm going to show them through my life by a consistent example. I'm going to pray for my children. I'm going to model faithfulness before my children. I'm going to talk about the Bible and God and creation and mercy and God's love and I'm going to be a faithful testimony before them and so we see here Pharaoh tempting to conform tempting to compromise don't go very far tempting to corrupt families by dividing the children away from their parents and then notice finally this morning there's this temptation to concede how many of you have noticed the devil never stops fighting he just never stops fighting and I want you to see that in chapter 10 and verse 24, the Bible says in chapter 10 and verse 24, And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be stayed, 
Let your little ones also go with you. And Moses said, Thou must give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. So here's the concession. It is a material concession. And so Pharaoh says, All right, look, I'm tired of the lice. I'm tired of the flies. I'm tired of all these plagues. Go ahead. You can go. You can, even, you can take your wife and kids. Take them with you. Just don't take your cattle and your herds. So again, the devil's saying, You can sell out to God, but not all the way. Now back then, they didn't have BMWs and Hyundais and Kawasaki's and Suzuki's. They had flocks and herds. And so what Pharaoh was saying is, I want you to come back here and be my slaves some more. And what the devil's saying is, I don't want to lose my grip on you, so you can go out there, but now don't take your material possessions. Don't, don't take your uh, flocks and your herds. And yet that was impossible for Moses. Why? Because giving was a part of the way they would worship. In other words, they needed their flocks and herds to provide sacrifices unto the Lord, to stay there. Genesis chapter 46 tells us about Israel or Jacob who took his journey. And notice it says, with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. In other words, God says, I want you to come with your whole life and follow after me. When the wise men in Matthew 2 and verse 11 came to Jesus and they found the babe in Mary, his mother, they fell down and worshiped him and they opened their treasures and they presented unto him gifts and treasures, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Listen, even the unsaved in this world believe that if there's a God that you believe is God, you will come to him and you will offer sacrifice to that God. And many of you, you've come to church, you've brought your children, you've overcome some of those compromises, but then when it's time maybe to give something to the missionaries, the devil's there saying, hey, listen, listen now, be careful now. Don't get all in like that. Be careful. Don't get too carried away. Uh, But Moses realized that giving was a part of their worship and that giving was a reflection of the heart. And the devil knows when you start giving, then your heart follows that gift and and your heart gets involved Luke Luke 12 34 where your treasure is there will your heart be also look in your notes for a moment at 2 Corinthians 9 and 7 every man according as he purposeth in his heart so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity for God loveth a cheerful giver let me ask you a question this morning have you gotten to the place where you have said to the Lord Lord every good gift in my life comes from you and Lord this car is yours and Lord this house is yours and these clothes are yours this computer is yours these children are yours it's all yours Lord and I want you to be glorified and whatever you want Lord it's yours and someone says oh that sounds a little weird does it Have you ever considered what the Bible says? What? Know ye not that you've been bought with a price? How many of you are thankful that Jesus Christ, that he shed his blood to cover your sin? See, see, here, God just says, Moses, I want you to come. How many days journey? How many? Just a little ways? Three. I want you to come three days journey. I want you to bring your wife, your children, and everything that's meaningful to you. And I want you to be willing to make a sacrifice. I want you to worship me. The word means to ascribe worth. To say, Lord, we count you worthy. Lord, we trust you to replenish what we have given. We worship you. Pharaoh tried a material concession. Some of you may have sensed this when the devil says in your heart, yeah, you don't need to really like give or anything. Don't get carried away with this thing. I mean, just because for 6,000 years believers have honored God that way, you can start a brand new tradition and you can be a Burger King Christian and have it your way. (laughs) That's what Pharaoh says. Have it your way material concession and then there's a spiritual conviction this conviction of Moses is amazing to me Exodus 10 25 notice what it says and Moses said thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God notice this our cattle also shall go with us there shall not an hoof be left behind someone I can hear someone saying oh Moses what a fundamentalist my goodness Everything, everyone, every hoof. I mean, does it really all have to belong to God? Notice what he says. For therefore, thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not 
what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. In other words, we don't know how much sacrifice. We don't know what it's going to take to feed all these people. We need to take everything with us. First Chronicles 29, 14. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. This is all I want you to remember this morning. There's a God who loves you, and he wants fellowship with you. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. There's a Pharaoh called the devil who's going to try to pull you back and pull you back and do everything he can so that you don't become a fully committed Christian. And he's going to offer you a lot of little compromises along the way. Four that we find in the Bible. Number one, the compromise to conform. Hey, you can have a bumper sticker that says you love Jesus. You can know a few of the songs, but look at just stay, you know, kind of stay in the mix of the worldly things. It's okay if you want to, you know, find some Christian friends, just slam down some vodka as long as you praise Jesus on Sunday. It's all right. Look at just stay in the world. And then there's the temptation to compromise. All right, if you want to be a little different, you can go a little ways, but don't go too far. You got to still know some of those choice words when you get mad. You got to be able to really converse in the worldly things, you know. Even though the Bible says that you know, we're, to be, uh, we're to be wise to the good and we're to be simple to the evil, it's okay to know some of the evil. And then there's this third temptation. And that temptation is to just kind of let the devil have his way with your family. You can love God, but it doesn't matter if everyone else does in your family. And then the fourth one is to concede in the area of, you know, all right, I'll, I'll go to church and everything, but I'm not going to really get involved with my treasure. I'll, I'll concede that to the devil. He can have the treasure. And if he does, he will soon have your heart. In 31 years of pastoring, I've never seen anybody stop following Jesus Christ before they, long before they stopped attending church, they stopped giving to the Lord. It's always that way first. Now I want you to turn to one final verse and then we'll be done. Turn to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Is everybody still with me? Four temptations to compromise. And I don't know about you, sometimes it might be overwhelming how the devil can come at you and try to pull you back. Sometimes you feel it, but you don't even know what's going on. But I've got some good news as we close. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And I want you to read this with me. So everybody grab a Bible and uh, share with a neighbor because we want to we get this right from the Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You got your Bible? Then let's read it together. Ready? Begin. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Make a way to escape. God says when that Pharaoh comes and he's telling you, do it my way, there's a way to escape that. And here's the way. Here's the way to escape it. Obey the Word of God. Moses just wouldn't let go of what God said. He wouldn't let go of it. He wouldn't let go of it. When Satan came to Jesus after 40 days of fasting and Satan said, if you're the Son of God, turn those rocks into bread, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So my challenge to you, my friends, hold on to the Word. The world will pull you. The Word of God will be your anchor in the times of temptation and compromise.